Welcome to The Craft. I'm your host, Mae Globus. This podcast is a collection of intimate conversations on artistry, mastery, and life with talented, passionately curious creatives and entrepreneurs. Most are dear friends, some are those I've admired from afar. I hope you enjoy these conversations, this exploration of the humanity that connects all of us as much as I do having them. Thank you for being here and for listening. This episode is sponsored by Happy Fox Health, a natural supplement brand focused on sea moss, a marine algae that has 92 out of 102 essential nutrients that your body needs to thrive and regenerate. I've used a number of their products and found it's really given me clarity of mind. Visit happyfoxhealth.com and use promo code THECRAFT for an exclusive 15 to 20% discount off your first product purchase. The artist Zoe Pollock is a beautiful human and beam of light. She is a way of connecting with others deeply upon first meeting them. Nothing is trite or superficial when in conversation with her. She is a beloved painter and product designer who has built a successful and sustainable business and body of work over the last 16 years. Born and raised in Vancouver, she was an intense child who spent her time playing basketball, singing, and drawing. She grew up attending a liberal, left-wing-leaning church and learned about Jesus from the perspective of him as a person of service, social justice, and steward of love. This idea of service is something woven into her approach as an artist and in her work. In this conversation, we explore her personality as a child and the types of questions she asked when she was young, her path to art and what she feels is her job as an artist, the way her mind starts to fire creatively once receiving a commission work or project, the challenge and beauty of creating an art exhibition in another language while she was living in Mexico, how sobriety has affected her life and work, her longtime spiritual nature and relationship with the divine, the essentialness of honest vulnerability in creating and perceiving art, and much, much more. Please enjoy this wide-ranging and intimate conversation with the wondrous, warm, vulnerable, and heart-wide-open Zoe Pollock. Zoe Pollock. Welcome to the craft. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Me too. I love connecting the dots on how we met. And we just met in person very recently. Yeah. But I feel like we have a lot of mutual friends. We do. And I've heard your name many times over the years. And so when you reached out, I just was really happy about that. And then we had coffee. We had a great conversation. Yeah. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. How are you feeling? So excited. So happy. I, I got to start my morning today. Um, with a, a reflection and, uh, and it was just so beautiful. It was this metaphor about, um, a, an eclipse being temporary and it's an apparition and, you know, that behind that is this big, bright, beautiful, amazing sun. So I stepped outside and decided to walk here and the sun was shining, which we know in Vancouver in spring is a real treat. So I feel excited and just thankful to be sober and thankful to be, yeah, alive and, able to move around yeah happy healthy yes tanned you were just yes. away you know, the glow <laughs> yeah you definitely got uh, the golden glow yeah I was I spent some time in California and um it was uh about a, like kind of a four-part trip it had a little piece of it where I was with my cousin on the Oregon coast and I drove down I drove both ways and um I was without my kids for the first portion and then they flew down for the second portion and so I had this wonderful time in Palm Springs with my parents connecting and connecting my son to the game of golf, which my mom loves. And so it was really a really special trip and then really stressful to drive home two days by myself, um, 16 hours one day and eight hours the next. And wow. it was pretty intense, but um, it was all worth it. Mm. Yeah. Did you listen to a lot of podcasts and music or did you drive in some silence? Yeah, it was surprisingly like... I thought I was also going to take a lot of phone calls, which I did. I took a few, you know, but I I spent a lot of time in silence just paying attention to the road. It was the first time I'd done a road trip, I realized, since I had had a meditative practice. And so it was so strange because driving is just this exact metaphor for like coming back, coming back. Oh, Mm -hmm. your tension's waning. Come back. Oh, there it's going. You know, so paying attention to what's outside, but then always kind of coming back to the road. So I don't know why it just ended up that my cu- when my cousin was there for part of the drive and we just like talked nonstop and it went by way faster mm. uh, with somebody else there like chatting with an adult but 
yeah, on the drive home, I got to see some really cool things along the coast and this epic sunset with my kids. We curved around this magnificent corner and saw this crazy sunset and there was an epic trashy cold play song on and <laughs> it was like so dramatic yeah, and all um, the senses were firing whoa yeah my kids were like this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen and I'm like I'm sure that's pollution but <laughs> let's just keep we're gonna yes mm -hmm, yeah was the, was it that hazy oh kind of, yeah oh, it was yeah. weird I was like oh that's not <laughs> nature <laughs> but okay we'll take what we can get right now yeah it's its own beauty yeah. it has its own beauty oh, God. <laughs> um I'd love to know what you were like as a child oh that's a great question yeah it's so interesting in in sobriety we talk about returning to being childlike you know we return to ourselves because there was this substance that was obscuring my view for 20 something years and so I'm just really getting to re-know myself in that way and reconnect those dots like, oh, I always used to draw or, oh, I always used to ask these types of questions or, oh, I was always precocious or whatever. And so, um, and I see a lot of it in my kids too. You, you recognize these things and you have this like living metaphor in front of you of like, oh, they've always been that way and they likely will never lose this sort of like essence of themselves. Um, and so one of the things I remember about being a kid was I never stopped singing, like all the Disney songs and stuff like that. I could, I can sing like the whole Aladdin soundtrack still, uh, perfectly. And so I have these, like, um, I didn't grow up in a particularly, um, musical family in the sense that there wasn't like a record player or music always on or names of bands, like really ever present in the, in the home. But my dad, um, played guitar and I, I remember, um, yeah, just always singing and um, always drawing and a very intense like I'm I'm not as um, strong a leader or an activist as my daughter but I see pieces of her and I'm like oh yeah that's that's who I was I was always like the the head of the basket the captain of the basketball team or like would get to know the substitute teacher really well like a lot of people pleasing a lot of like I was also very tall so it had like a big influence on like how I stood up as a leader mm -hmm. early on in my childhood. Mm -hmm. and, and you stood tall. Yeah. 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 Mm. You were saying, um, you were reflecting on, oh, yeah, you used to draw. Oh, I, yeah, I used to ask these kinds of questions. What kind of questions would you ask? Oh, I mean, right away what comes to mind is I had no idea that not everybody had a deep spiritual life from the very beginning. I, I had a very strong sense of my companionship with what I'll call God, which I can say now just one time, universe, love, infinity, unicorn, whatever, but I call them God. And um, so I had a very early relationship with this companion and I had infinite questions about how that came to be and my place in that and where was God in me and what about other religions and how does this all work together? And um, I was always wanting to journal and pray and, and um, I had it and still do have an insatiable um, appetite for sort of how all of these things fit together and where the divine is moving between us and how we're, we're very much in this world, but we're not mm. of this world. Mm -hmm. Was it a religious home and a spiritual yeah. home? So it's, um, I, I always, I, lo I love talking about this because I feel so fortunate and it's, I just feel very, very lucky. I was born in a home where we went to church, um, but it was a really like liberal, left-wing, open, kumbaya kind of um, Jesus-loving church. And I was taught that Jesus came here, the historical figure of Jesus came here, nomadic, poor, homeless, sat on the ground, led the people. His disciples were just dudes who were following him around. And um, so the church that we've come to know, the church that a lot of people were raised in, um, is not a church that I understand that Jesus would have um, condoned. If you think about it, grandiosity and big buildings and lots of spending on things and big screens and big bands and big rah, 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 never mind all of the atrocities that that church had sort of conducted in its name. The Jesus I was introduced to as a child was a person of service. And um, so we grew up in a house where social justice was like a huge part of um, dinner table conversations. And my extended family would always talk about being meek, being humble, um, being stewards of love. 
And um, if you weren't living in service, you weren't really a follower of Jesus, Hmm. Um, that he came to help the least of the least, the hurting, the poor, the hungry. And uh, my my upbringing was rooted in that. Mm. What were your parents like? My parents still are um, wonderful people who, my mom was the head of parks and recreation and my dad was a professor. And so they, um, very much had jobs, which is different from myself being an entrepreneur, which we can talk about after. But, um, what they, what they were like was my mom, they were always moving around, like, um, in terms of having lots of, um, activities going on in the house. They valued healthy food. They were like the first parents, ever to introduce anybody to granola and the avocado like we were the first family to like ever have (laughs) now everybody's doing it but it it, we really they were they were hippies originally they met when they were 22 they rode around on bikes they fell in love and um we didn't have a ton of extra money so we camped everywhere so we were taught to value the outdoors my two brothers live on remote islands because they just I think just are so we were raised to just love nature and, and, um, yeah, my dad as an, as a innate teacher, he still will teach anyone sailing or teach anyone the ukulele or te- he's, you know, he's a teacher inside of himself. So mm-hmm. yeah, lots of like outdoors and exercise and good values. Yeah. And then you were drawing when you were, you were a kid. So art has been in your bones for a long time. Well, since yeah. you were born probably. Yeah, for sure. I always had like a natural aptitude towards it. And then being raised in a house where like that was always available to me, like some, you know, some crayons on in the, you know, we weren't allowed a lot of TV, if any TV. I mean, I always say I wasn't raised with TV. I think we got like a half an hour every twice a week or something. Like I really didn't. So I was one of those weird kids who like in high school and they'd be like, you know, saying references about shows. I was just so lost. I was like, Oh, I'm still, (laughs) still, I'm like, is that from Grey's Anatomy? <laughs> You're like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what? I was thinking about what you said about um, you being so spiritual and, and feeling d- the divine since you were, you were young. In my episode with Steve Rio, who's also a, a good friend of yours, I was telling him about a podcast that I listened to you on um, the Rich Roll podcast. And he was interviewing this woman, Lisa Miller, who is a a psychologist and and, an author. And she was talking about the importance of, well, they've done studies where um, adolescents, they, they learn through the studies that adolescents have this hunger for spiritual transcendence, like in that kind of teenage years. And she was saying it's in, it's important for, um, people at that age to experience something like like that, to experience the divine, because that allows them to just see the world differently and to expand. And so I shared with him um, one that I had and that you know when I was sixteen, and I, I I haven't forgot it ever since. And I'm wondering, did you have a specific moment where you were like, oh, I'm part of something bigger? Yeah, that's a great, um, a great. Uh, an important really important uh, truth I think it's like getting to see an, a UFO if you get to see a UFO when you're 11 you can't unsee that it's like you can do nothing with it you can choose to ignore that for the rest of your life but it's like it would be rad though <laughs> it's rad and it's like oh that's that's real and that was like a real experience and so then what you do with that um, you can either unravel that forever or or just like kind of tuck it down and put it to rest. And so we see a lot of people doing this, but in answer to you more specifically to your question, like um, one, first of all, uh, in all the youth work that I've ever done, I think it's been the funnest thing is to watch teenagers have had that experience. And having watched my daughter go through that um, too, it was just so cool when she was seven, eight, nine, especially around the age of 10, 11, she just really had this like these radical kind of spiritual awakenings and and still is continuing to. So that's just amazing. Um, Yeah, I had what I would call, I was brought to like this kind of rowdy, really emotional church and I had what what we would call a conversion moment. And um, I didn't convert to anything, I guess. I, I wouldn't call it that. I guess I I just felt the Holy Spirit, which I would now call like, you know, any sort of like 
this, the, the, the greater, big, beautiful, huge love, spirit, infinity, universe, you know, orb kind of flow through me. And I was 12 years old and I was crying and I was like, um, it was radical. It was like a love that I was like, oh, I'll never not know that this happened to me. You know, mm. it's like you can, it's like a dream. You can wake up from it, but like um, you can also choose to like go back to sleep and enter at any time. And now that I know I've studied more and um, I know that I have um, ways that I can enter that state now by choice. Like mm -hmm. now we can choose to dip into the river, you know, whenever we want, so to speak. So yes, yeah. yes. And, and if you're ever off kilter to when you have that feeling, yeah, and you know the ways to get back to yeah. it, just brings you so much back into balance and centered and feel filled with love again. And yeah. it's it's nice to be able to feel that. Yeah, totally. Do you see the divine in everything? Well, it was just, it was so interesting. Just this morning I heard someone say, um, when I'm in right spiritual fitness, you know, when I'm, when I am in, it, it's like, if we talk about physical fitness, if, if you and I are walking along, there's this big mountain, you're like, hey, do you think you could sprint up that mountain? And I'm like, yeah, you know what? Well, like not, a, yeah, yeah. No, if I'm in, if I'm in right physical fitness in like good physical shape, uh, that mountain doesn't seem that big to me or that daunting. Uh, it doesn't even really seem like a mountain. So when we're in, you know, right sh shape with ourselves and we can kind of get back there and recalibrate, it's like, oh yeah, then there's the divine and everything. But mm. no, like when I was in the dark in November, I was like in the deep dark for about five weeks, I would say. I don't, if you'd ask me that question, <laughs> I'd be like, oh, there is nothing <laughs> spiritual here, lady. Like, You're I like, am, this is all I, the void. Yeah, I'm in the dark. Void. I can't even make a lunch for my kid and like crawl back in bed and just hate everything so yeah I was reading your site and while I was doing research and I read something um and I thought it was really beautiful and I'm just gonna to read it um it said that you believe great work tells the individual narrative with an honest vulnerability that allows the viewer to step into a shared narrative that they can then claim as their collective truth when I read that, I felt such a resonance in my body around that statement. There's such a beauty to it, like a, a oneness. Can you maybe expand more on what you meant by that? Yeah, so for context, what Ame is talking about is reading from my website, right? Is yes, that correct. correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been a painter full time for 16 years. And um, so what I'm describing there specifically is that I've had a 16 year career a professional career of people stepping into my studio and purchasing something uh, and saying, like, I don't know what this is, but let's say it's a painting of a, a blue vessel, a blue vase or something. And them saying, I don't know what this is about, but the title got to me and I feel this cool sadness with it. And it's really strange, but I, it just has to go in my home and, and I'm very drawn to it. And so what I believe is happening there um, is that the artist, it sort of stems from a, like um, a, an idea, ology that was introduced to me with Rothko. So when you're standing in front of Rothko's work, um, Rothko believed that he, those are those massive sort of color field paintings that are larger than life. And they're like soft rectangles just for context for the listener. So when you stand in front of those paintings, the painter himself um, intended that you transcend your body so that you have a spiritual experience. And so, in, you know, in this way, painting is an act of service. He's a vessel and he is doing this on behalf of sort of this greater good. And what I'm specifically saying in that, um, that text is that I am here to be of service. And so when you step into the visual of what you, ex what you may experience in my work, my job is to art visually articulate what you might be feeling. So if there's something that tugs on the inside of you, if there's people who have forgotten how to feel something, if they see a painting of a sad woman and they kind of go, huh, maybe I'm feeling a little sad. And they start to sort of start to tug on that thread. And maybe the painting is called Sad Woman and they have this really obvious sort of like connection to it. And they kind of recall. My, my work is about sort of having you wake up from um, this slumber, I guess, essentially. And what I've been witness to is people stepping into my showroom and being like, I don't know, even if they don't purchase the work, but just being like, I don't know what this is, but like, I'm feeling something. And literally may saying to me, is that okay? Like, like I, 
so many times. I don't know what this is, but I'm feeling something. Is that all right? And I'm like, what? Yeah. Or I don't know what it is. Will it offend you if I tell you what it is? It's like, no, the work isn't done until you experience it. So for me, it's like, it's kept me from, my whole career has been about like trying to ensure that I don't come from an egoic, like that my ego is so big that I'm like, this is me, myself, and I, and these are my feelings, and they're massive, and they're really um, not generous and not open. Like, I want to be the opposite of that. I want to. I want you to complete the work by feeling and experiencing it, and mm. in doing so, honoring and respecting the viewer first, because without them, I don't have a career. Right. Oh, that's so interesting that you're saying, you know, people will say, is that okay that I feel this way? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. asking for permission to feel yeah. a certain way. Yeah, and I, I had this experience where most, most of my clients are very wealthy. Like that's very a very obvious fact. And in fact, it, it's kind of a funny anecdote that people don't think about. But like I've always been a class lower than my viewers, mm-hmm. right? Which is like a strange, you know, we're all human and who cares? And I make money, you make money, it doesn't matter. But like it's a strange, oftentimes all I'm saying is like they're extremely wealthy. And so they've come to this wealth through like a lot of oftentimes like a lot of sacrifice right a lot of like either hard work or or sacrifice in the sense of like yeah my 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 partner sent me here to purchase some work but like I'm so lonely like he travels a lot for work or something so there's sacrifice everywhere um and so because I'm so like attuned to that and that's like like I service this particular type of clientele um, I've been able to have these really like honest, amazing conversations through the work. So one ex- short example is like I made this painting one time where this house was on fire because I was feeling like um, I had no money and I had these tiny toddlers and I was drinking. And, and so I just made this painting that's like quite beautiful. It's just like this ethereal kind of painting of like these flames enveloping this house and the person who came to purchase it is like, you know, this multimillionaire and she buys it. And I, I said, she said, can you tell me what the work is about? And I, I, I just told her a little bit, you know, I was just honest. And she goes, oh, man. I said, you may not have experienced that ever. And she goes, you have no idea. Like, she goes, yes, I, I live that every day. Like, I'm, I'm drawn to this work because the house is on fire. So here we are in what I perceive to be a different class. And she's like, listen, lady, woman to woman, like, it doesn't matter how much money you have, like, my house is on fire too. Mm. And so her being drawn to, she, she couldn't maybe visually articulate that. Then for somebody to purchase something and consume it permanently and let that live in their own home is like, it's such an honor, like mm. that they wake up every morning to that or that they have their dinner with this piece of art. It's like, yeah, that's like such an honor. Right. It's almost like they look at that art every day and it's like, oh, that piece understands me exactly yeah and everything from like the most like super you know what I perceive to be a superficial painting that's just about like ethereal color or or the ocean or just something really um not controversial or not super super steeped in um you know deep narrative it's like still they're like oh my god that painting is my place of rest and and respite and um that you let me have that every day is just like such a gift and I'm like Mm -hmm. oh dude yeah you know I'm so thankful you know I I love um you know the idea of energy and energy exchange and you know I I wonder if viewers of art also feel the energy that the artist put into that that piece if it actually emanates and is like an actual energy feeling that comes from the canvas or whatever it is back onto them for sure I think that like it's like saying like wouldn't that be true of a song like we listened to a song that was written in the 60s or written yesterday and it's like it's lo- alive inside of us because in this present moment it's like re- it's sound that's like moving through us and we're like there's nothing more alive than this to me right mm-hmm. and so it's like um it's it, stuff that I've made many 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 years ago um that's still like alive to people that they they tell they get to tell me about it's it's a strange medium because like I'm moving into different mediums now as forms of expression, which we can talk about. But like it, it's a silent medium. It's it's very odd. 
Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't ever say anything. I don't say anything to it. It's just a visual medium. So it can exist without words. Um, It's a strange medium. It lives usually in residential private spaces. It's extremely expensive. It's silent. All these attributes that are are a bit odd and a bit unlike me. Mm. So I'm sort of kind of learning a lot about that. Mm. And you were talking about different mediums that you're using or that you're um, starting to to work with and you do sculpture as well. Uh, I'm curious when you move through different materials or using different mediums, do you find an, is there an ease when you do that or is it more of, oh, that's a different medium, that's a different material. I love the challenge of it. Yeah, when you work in a different medium there's sort of things that are the same and things that are different right so like if you think about when I was designing carpets like I've designed three lines of carpets with um with a partner um a lot of those processes just more broadly before it before I speak specifically about carpet design it's like rug design um you're more of those processes are collaborative so when I paint it's just me with my paint you know I'll, I'll have an assistant or like I'll have a studio manager coming and going like I have a little staff but it's like a, a private process of just me with my hand and I know how to complete the thing from start to finish. So I have full, full reign um, over the, and like a, a range of capacity in that medium. You know, I'm, I'm like, it's my mother tongue. I'm articulate in it, you know, completely and completely autonomous, I think is the most important thing about that. Whereas when I work in other mediums, like sculpture, furniture design, whatever, I've, I've had to, by virtue of the medium itself, work with others so those are inherently collaborative and that's mostly what I've enjoyed about them is so when I've worked in like for example rug design like I don't know how to make it in the computer machine but I work with my collaborator and like she and I are able to like Mm -hmm. make this thing come to life so and what you're asking about more specifically is like what's similar about it well we're just doing color texture and like feeling and content within a rectangle Mm -hmm. and so it's very much like people are like, whoa, that's blowing my mind. Like, how did you design a rug? And it's like, it's a rectangle with like some rules about like, just like a, a feeling and a vibe about mm-hmm. like how this should lay and how it should feel and like how these colors should work together. Mm. I want to go back to your creative process. And I'm curious about when a commission or a project or idea comes to you, how do you both your mind and body begin to fire and feel as you begin to contemplate the project? Yeah, so I guess um, what's, there's sort of two processes. There's many pro- a range of processes in our studio, but um, there's kind of commissioned work, which is brought on by like an, an invitation from a client to, to make something. I've done over 450 custom pieces. Um, and then there's just the, my own process where I'm doing things like kind of on my own. And so um, when it's a when it's an invitation from a client to like make something um, for their living room or a larger project where like a developer is saying like, hey, we need these four pieces for a lobby in San Francisco. This is what we're thinking, like hot pink. This is the budget. You know, there's some sort of like what I think a lot of people would perceive as restraints or restraints for lack of a better term around this project. What I like about that is that it's exciting to work within the confines, sort of preconceived confines of this Um, proposed project and so my brain starts firing in terms of execution how can we make this happen and how can we ensure with commission work the the customer has to be happy so it's a work back from their sheer joy and satisfaction it's they're the paying customer Um, so I think coming from the service industry because I was a waitress for seven years and just like I read a book called Hug Your Customer early on when I first started my career at like 24 years old. And it's like, um, I'm I'm not only like of service by being a painter in that spiritual sense of like applying paint, like, um, but I'm of service in terms of like ensuring that my customers are happy. And so the ethos of our studio sort of stems from that. And we just kind of do a work back from that. So that sounds really unsexy and it's like, really rooted in pragmatism and I think everybody who's worked for me in total now that might be like eight or nine people who've ever worked for me they've they've been like kind of stunned or 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 people who listen to podcasts or interviews of me it's like 
it's a, it's a really pragmatic process. We're shipping twice a week. Like things have to be a certain size. Like they have to be framed properly. Like the email has to be typed properly. Like, there is so much that goes into my career that's like really functional and really um, pragmatic. But from that place, then when I get to make these like hot pink massive pieces for this lobby and it's sloppy and it's fun and it's like I know what I can do within the realm of like what's been sort of set out for me, mm. I feel there's like a lot of freedom there. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you're very open about your journey with sobriety. And I wanted to explore or ask, how has that journey shaped or evolved or informed your work? Yeah, so... Um, the reason that I'm open about it is because the second I opened my mouth about it, um, I found out that so many people were privately suffering, quietly suffering. And once one person comes out to you and says, like, hey, you speaking up and saying that you had a drinking problem, like, really helped me because I felt this camaraderie, like, I felt safe enough to say, like, put my hand up and be like, me too, you know, like, I also am struggling. Um so that wasn't ever really by choice. It's just also been like, you know, um, something that I feel like the second I say it, everybody in the room is allowed to like breathe out a big sigh of relief and be like, oh, yeah, alcohol. Mm, <laughs> oh, yeah. That old thing. Oh, that old alcohol. And it's like, it's, it's like, um, and then also you, you start to learn like a tiny bit about it. And you're like, oh, my gosh, like this is a you want to talk about a pandemic, like we've got millions of people that are s privately and quietly struggling and suffering and, um, and then like what it does to families and it just, there's so much, um, under that rug if you kind of just are willing to like just pull it up even a tiny bit. So, um, that's sort of where that comes from. And then, um, the way it's affected my work specifically, I guess, I guess it's just affected my life and, my, my work is a part of my life. And so my work is more clear or like more profitable or like more loving or more whatever, because my life is more clear, more kind, more loving, more profitable. So it's just mm. my work is an extension of what I get to do here. And um, I, I just I, again, I was reminded this morning like that we get to do this is like a real privilege and that I get to be sober is like, I'm just so, 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 so lucky. I'm just, and I, and it, I mean, and I, I also get emotional when I think about that in this, like, I'm really lucky. Like it, you should hear some of the, some of the stories and some of the, um, it's just like, I just feel like I, I got out alive, you know, I mm. got, it's like, I, I'm a survivor from a plane crash and I just got to like walk away. And there's a lot of people like living in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, it's a real, um, it's a real thing and it's a real disease and it's a really has its hold on people. Mm. Um, really, 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 really good people. Mm. What do you think it's about you that you were able to kind of escape that vice like grip of it? that some people can't seem to escape? Well, I think that being exposed to other people who had gotten sober was like a big thing, right? That people I went out for brunch with my girlfriend, Heather White, one day, and she had just gotten sober. And I just sat down, and she had this like glow about her. And I swore to myself in a millisecond, I was like, I don't know whatever this girl is like drinking or eating or whoever she's having sex with like whatever she is doing I am going to do it because I was like <laughs> if she tells me that it's like crazy tantra you know Bali whatever I'm like I'm gonna drink whatever Kool-Aid she's <laughs> like dishing out because she just had this I was like what is going on with you and she's like I quit drinking alcohol and I was like what and from that second, like a seed was planted in my heart. So I think exposure and, and that's like why I mention again, why I just like say it out loud, because it's literally just somebody being like, I remember I sat down at this other party. I had a bunch of seeds planted in me like a year before I actually quit drinking. And I sat at this birthday party and I sat beside this girl, Brie, and she's like, I'm like, what's uh, what's you're not having a drink? And she's like, no, no. And I'm like, oh, what? what's up? And she's like, Oh, I, I can't drink. I don't drink. And I'm like, why not? And she's like, Oh, I had to retire. <laughs> and mm. she just laughs. And I think that lightheartedness, I'm like, why were you not very good at it? She goes, Oh no, 
I was very, very good at it. I was, I was too good. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, it this, needed like stop. yeah, this sense of humor about it, this dark humor, like this kind of funny. And I was like, oh, that's a world I could enter into. And then when I, when I, when I read hip sobriety for the first time, it was like this contemporary language that I could step into that Holly Whitaker had started and, and, um, was championing and, and really like, I got sober by like privately reading all the stuff that that Holly was dishing out and Laura McCohen at the time and mm. they've gone on to write books and and now it's called The Tempest and they've got different ways that they have created this contemporary language for people who are struggling with alcohol um, and there's many 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 different programs like Tony Rosen as well as wonderful like integrates yoga and breathing and we realize that it's like a full body full spirit full soul um, and cultural problem it's a culture it's the cultural norm to drink and the fact that it was culturally acceptable for me to binge drink uh, is in and of itself really disturbing and indicative of a culture that is not well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is using it to feel better or to, to numb. I haven't, dry, I haven't had a, any alcohol for two years now. Mm-hmm. And um, originally it was, it was linked to just some, I was having some health issues and um, went to a traditional Chinese medicine doctor and he was like, you know, cut out the sugar, cut out the alcohol for as long as you're on this tea program. And when I was done the tea program and tried to integrate alcohol back, and it wasn't, I was a social drinker. I didn't even really drink all that much, but something in my body had changed in that six to eight months. And when I tried to incorporate drinking back in, my liver actually hurt every time I tried and I was like oh my body's different now it says it doesn't like it so I'm not gonna do it <laughs> I've heard this uh, like about a dollar for every time I heard this which is is just such a cool and that's what like Holly and talks about too is like this spectrum of alcohol use right and we find ourselves in different places along this spectrum of alcohol use and you found yourself in a very different place than I did and um and I, I've literally heard the story a million times of like people who just like the body outgrew it. It's like, I didn't even really want to quit, but the body quit it for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and then like what's happened as a result of that for people is really trippy where they're like, yeah, I knew it wasn't even a problem. I only did it every second Thursday, one glass of wine or whatever. And then this whole other world opens up for them where they're like, Oh, this was really ethanol. It's like poison. And yeah, it's, it's like, it's crazy that, yeah, it can just kind of like unfold and and wake you up and just make you feel cleaner and yeah, and clearer yeah. and and I've I've contemplated a number of times too when my body had changed. It was before I made the transition into sound therapy. And a part of me wonders if my body somehow knew that it needed to be a cleaner vessel before I moved into holding space for others. I'm really glad that you brought that up because I have journalings about how I would be a leader. I talked about being a natural leader when I was a child Mm -hmm. and I never knew. So I've like officiated friends weddings or like I love to step into these. I do speeches at funerals like I I like to lead. I like to be in a position where I'm like of service through being able to like help somebody write their speech or like kind of, um, but I always was unsure as to like how I would do that if I was drunk every third day, you know, or if somebody ever found out this big bad secret because I mostly drank in private, like, and not all the time. And so it was like so inconsistent and therefore like I was unpredictable and I was inconsistent unto myself. And so I would never have been able to say, like now I could say to you, like I can hold space for you anytime you show up at my house at 2 a.m. and you need me. I've got you. And it's like, I, I couldn't be that predictable, even though it wasn't, I wasn't drinking like every day, you know? Mm. So it's like, I do think that, and I hear about this, like when people are called to like a higher vibration or to a, a role of leadership or holding space for others or forms of healing, it's like, it kind of sometimes just falls away. Mm-hmm. And it really does. Like I don't really miss it yeah. at, at all. And, uh, 
Yeah, and I just feel so much clearer, and it's great. Yeah, and people talk about the mornings. People are like, oh, my God, the mornings are so much better. <laughs> yeah. It's so cool. I didn't know what I was missing. Yeah, and, like, exactly. It's so, yeah, it's super fun. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about uh, speeches and, and writing, and um, I just uh, had this this question around an exhibition that you did in Mexico way long ago, and from what I read, it was – a high realism set of works and you had to photograph the subjects and you touched upon how interesting and challenging it was to do this in another language in a different cultural context and I've always been fascinated with the nuances of a foreign language the things that often get lost in translation where there's no apples to apples translation from that language into another language so I'm curious to know what you learned from creating that exhibition in Mexico under those unique foreign conditions oh thanks for that question and taking the time to find that. I don't even know where you would have found that on the <laughs> interweb but bless you um yeah it takes me back so I was 22 years old I did an exhibition 22 23 and I lived in Puebla and I went and photographed these men who were working on this road between this like super historic town of Cholula and our really 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 bougie uh, very expensive university I was fortunate enough to go there because I was able to do an exchange and um what I wanted to look at was like what is required when people are like the labor that is it was it was a simple metaphor like maybe an innocent sort of 22 year olds art exhibition about like this this labor that was required for these people to literally build something that would allow us to move between this historic town and this really bougie university and um one of what I, I specifically remember that experience having asked of me a lot of bravery. Um, I have gotten to do a lot of the things in my life because I felt afraid and done it anyways. And I remember being extremely f afraid. And um, further, I had to bring a friend with me. I had to bring my Spanish speaking friend and ask for help. So I would say that that experience had two elements to it. One, having to be brave and doing it anyways asking these men if I could take their picture and two, asking for help, literally having to have somebody there to help me. My Spanish was okay at the time because I had lived in South America when I was 14. I lived in Chile and so I had already lived in Spanish. I remember distinctly um, being 14 years old and having never spoken Spanish before, but I was in an all girls private Catholic school there. And I remember starting to dream in Spanish about halfway through. And um, I knew then that I had gotten a grasp of the language and that I was like fully saturated and steeped in steeped in that language but I'll tell you that memory from that just a bit off of your question but it's like relating to language it's like it was so tiring to do something in your in a second oh, it was at the time it was my third language but yeah it was like exhausting mm -hmm. and so much is lost in translation the thing that's humbling about functioning in your second or third language is that I wasn't funny I wasn't that interesting I wasn't I was inside. I knew I thought I was right. It's very, it's, it's the, the epitome of being humbled because Zoe doesn't get to kind of shine or, sh or come through, or you have to find these other ways. So like in Chile, I had to join the basketball team or I would have to do other, give people my snacks, you know, or whatever ways I could kind of like show people that I was generous or, or fun, loving, or a good person. I had to, I couldn't use my language to show them that. Mm. Right, right. You have to do it with gesture and yeah, totally. facial expression. Yeah, <laughs> my girlfriend, like, we would paint, we, her mom let us paint her room, my girlfriend Allie, and, and um, she, let, you know, I was tall enough to reach the supplies up at the top of this shelf, I remember, and um, there's this Tupperware container, and I'm, I'm grabbing around for the art supplies, and she's going, abuela, abuela, which means grandmother, and I'm like, what the hell is this girl talking about? And you know, I pull this box down and it's, I guess her grandmother was in this box, um, her, her ashes, but I didn't understand what oh, she was no talking way. about. I thought I was being helpful. So it was like this really funny and, and she just explained to me kind of through gestures and like this really tender thing that had, had happened for her. And it, mm. this is the comedy of being in like another language. And we yes. grab the paints and we, you know, paint her room full of butterflies and stuff and carry on as teenagers do. But it was just like, a really funny time. And it's so interesting when you are trying to communicate with someone and you're not speaking the same language, I find that you're more animated. You know, Absolutely. you're trying, your gestures are bigger, your facial expressions, and it's, it's like acting. Almost. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 And I notice now, like, 
when I'm trying to explain things to my partner or like where I'm coming from, like, yeah, we do that even in English because we're trying to kind of like, <laughs> do you understand <laughs> that this would go on the left of the sink? And they're like, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. They're like, you don't have to yell at me about that. And you're like, oh yeah, I guess that makes sense. Like I'm trying to like get this point across and like, but it's like kind of clunky and not yeah. as gracious. Oh. I, yeah, I'm always fascinated with the nuances of language. And, you know, I, I've used this example before, but I, I love the uh, books of Haruki Murakami. And he's a postmodern um, writer from Japan and mm. um, translated, you know, his books are translated everywhere around the world. And they're so beautiful in English and they're so fantastical. But I often wonder what I'm missing mm-hmm. from the original yeah. version yeah, and what that would be that would be like to to know but also there's a beauty in like not knowing that yeah either. totally so or when you hear like one of your favorite poets is like they've got this revised version like something got like these new translators like revived it after 20 years or something and you're like what about the old roomie like I uh, you know or yeah <laughs> like what was yeah and it's like but we know that this like the best stories are the ones that like keep building on themselves and have little nuances of fiction and absolutely uh, for sure you were talking a lot about being a leader and I'm curious how is it that you want to how do you want to lead like what does that mean to you yeah I think I I use the word leadership broadly and so I'm glad you asked that I think we're all like called to different forms of leadership I mean that as being a mom I mean that as being a sober woman. I mean that as wearing what I want to wear so that other people can see that and say like, oh my gosh, that looks brave or that looks exciting or that looks fun. Like maybe I can do that too. Glennon Doyle talks about it like handing out permission slips. You know, like you wearing a fabulous funky outfit on a Monday. I can be like, oh, wow. (laughs) I can, you know, it's like granting me permission to express myself. So all of these different ways in which we can lead. And, um, you know, right now I'm, having to learn how and and, and it's it, th- this is like you know parenting what i'm learning we know this it's not like a top down process we're like i'm the boss and you guys have to follow i'm following the lead of my teenagers i'm learning how to listen better and kind of understand them and um learning about that dance between listening and leadership and and steve rio um bless him um has a couple times given me the compliment that he, he said you know What makes you a great leader is that you're soft and strong, soft and strong, strong and soft, soft and strong. And um, so I I always listen to that. I I think about that often when I'm being too strong, when I'm being too soft. I like, okay, what's its opposite and how can I kind of step into um, being a better leader? Um, And yeah, working with other older, like really wise women. Um, and asking them like processes for leadership. I loved, we just read Dare to Lead in our book club, like our I've lady book club. It's very good. Mm-hmm. It's very rich. You could keep reading that book for like 20 years and still not be, a, you know, a great leader. But it's um, it's very, very good. It gave me a lot to chew on. Um, so yeah, just looking at leadership too as like studying it and learning like just being open to like it being a way that I need to like learn more and um, I love like girls basketball. I was the coach um, here before pre-pandemic. I was coaching a lot, and um, so I love those, you know, type types of community service and mm. that kind of stuff too. Mm. And you mentioned your your kids; they're teenagers. What what have they taught you recently? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, you know, I've been really humbled lately. I've been really, um, I'm, I'm living in that place between they know who they are and they know what they need and they know what they need to do to like, oh, they, I think they really need their mom to scoop in right now and, and pick them up early and kind of tuck them under my wing and, and make them a hot chocolate and kind of say no, you know, so I'm living in this place that's like exactly where they are. And, and, um, listening to them, but also letting them know that I'm like steady and sturdy. I think when you get sober, you, you have to continually like show your children that you're reliable. And so I've just 
made it my goal to become like a reliable person. And I'm not always in emotional sobriety. So sometimes my, you know, one of my children will provoke me and then I kind of uh, spin out and I have to return and make amends and kind of um, return to like, oh shit, I'm a human and I'm sorry. And so lately it's been humility and um, them kind of like leading me to this really strong desire to want to be a woman of integrity um, so that they can rely on me so that they know that I'm like super, 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 super secure. Um, and then also just exposing my humanity in that. Mom's crying right now because she's really sad. I'm really sad that this thing happened. And I'm also going to go to work. And I also care about you. Mm. And you also have to show up at Muay Thai or, you know, and there's a lot of ands in our house right now. It's like, you know, this is happening and mm. we have to, you know, stick to our word. Teaching them a lot about sticking to their word. Mm. Um, yeah. There's that soft, strong, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's just the inclusivity that life happens and you know yeah kind of gotta roll with it as they say yeah mm. I think giving your children the capacity to know how to pivot and change and shift and ebb and flow like that's what my previous partner and I did really well was like um th I think that's our parenting strength is like knowing that they um would be in this world that was like changing so fast and the only thing I can reconnect them to is like, how does it feel? I have this sign in my house that says, pay attention to how it feels after you do the thing. So it's like if they fib and then they feel awful, like I can only connect them to that lifelong feeling of like, that feels really shitty to lie. But I can't be with them every single day being like, don't lie, don't lie, don't lie, don't lie. I can, I can re-remind them how to go back inside of themselves and be a person become a person of integrity mm. um so that's what we're working on in our house mm, i love that how does it make you feel after you've done the thing yeah wow i'm gonna incorporate that into my own life yeah well you know it a little bit doesn't more. feel great when you just skip the thing or you know interrupt your friend or send a mean email or whatever you did mm -hmm. you just skip it can kind of translates across it's like oh that doesn't feel good yeah. There's this like kind of sticky feeling inside of me. And the more we can reconnect to that and then make a quick amends and like, oh, that didn't feel very good the way I the way I interrupted you on Thursday. I feel really bad about that. And the, usually the person will just we forgive and forget and move on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like, so people are like, oh, I didn't even notice. That was great. It was fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is there is there one thing that you want to do for yourself that you've been putting on the back burner that now you're like, no, I need to do that for me. Oh yeah, so you're 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 a brilliant interviewer <laughs> and an intuitive woman. Um, so I have a pilot that I'm writing, and I have a 12 week kind of set out. Uh, it should be done by June 30th. I have a coach that I'm working with, Patricia, and so I had uh, flushed out this pilot. I'm about two thirds of the way through um, what's called a show bible, which is what you would pitch um, to pitch a show, and um, so I'm writing this um, larger thing. So I always write, I write a little bit of poetry and like a little bit, you know, I'll write essays or you can look up online. I've written some stuff here and there, but like nothing formal and nothing big um, and comprehensive. So yeah, I've pulled it out. I've kind of shaken the dust off. I had a really rough year this last year and, um, and I accidentally fell in love. And, and so these, this, you know, as you know, this really gets in the way. And um, so I, I've uh, re, re-centered on that being a priority and so yeah it should be done by June 30th oh. for myself and like registered with the writers guild of blah 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 something something I don't really right. know the whole process but I'm um yeah really excited about it that's very exciting oh we do need a part two yeah <laughs> to chat after that <laughs> when you look at your canon of work up until now how does it make you feel oh gosh incredibly fortunate um very proud very fortunate. You know, I, I do the work that I'm doing because, um, one, it feeds my family. Like it's, I've been living off, making my living off of making work full time for 16 years. And I'm very proud of that. But, um, more than that, I do it so that, uh, young people or young women or parents, 
um, not just mothers, but anybody with children and so that people feel inspired so that they know, like, again, like that idea of grant granting permission slips. It's like when people say to you, like, how do you sound healing? Like, how do you do that? And like, part of what you're doing is the thing itself, but part of it is like shows other people that like it's possible at all. So mm -hmm. that's, that's like why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm. And if you look back at your life, and how far you've come and, and your, your evolution. Um, what are you most proud of? I mean, I can't answer that question without first saying I was born into a safe, beautiful country with water and fresh air and, um, and to two parents who said, go and do anything and be anything and born into safety. And, um, so I, I, 99% of the answer to that question is just the, that I'm fortunate. Um, I'm most proud of being a sober woman. That It's like, I don't know how else to explain it. It's like, I wasn't myself before. And now I've like been granted this opportunity to be like, like it's like a rebirth and be like awake again and um, awoken from this like, way of coping that was really destructive like it, it was like a tornado of destruction and um yeah so I feel really excited and proud of that and I, I put a lot of work into it so I will if you're saying like what do you feel the most proud of like every day I work towards that I read the book or I go to the session or I do whatever it is I put all my time effort energy money and resources into like my wellness so that I can like be of service mm. And my final question that I ask everyone, with what you do, what is it that you want to leave behind in the world? Yeah, that legacy of wellness, like that we get to um, dive deep inside, um, you know, that we get to tell each other that we love each other. And um, yeah, just don't forget, don't forget to like say thank you and and tell each other that we, how much we care, mean to each other and care about each other and mm. yeah. So you beautiful human, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your story and sharing your art with the world. I look forward to so many more conversations with you offline. Yeah. And um, me too. Thank you. Thank Just you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. If you enjoyed that last conversation, be sure to check out more episodes with Craft on Spotify and guest photo galleries on the website at wearethecraft.com. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>